competency to fellowship. Um, uh, as with the other webinars this year, this one is sponsored um, by the ONTPD, TCAN, and then the Future News Now group um, with our creator, Michelle Bartlett, as one of the um, panelists today. So that is a lovely treat. You can go to the next slide. Um, so my name is Meg Lanila Canton. I'll be one of um, the hosts for the webinar today. Um, I am a current resident at the University of Michigan. Yes, and my name is Medic Demirhan. I'm one of the uh, third year pediatric residents at SUNY Downstate, and I will be one of the hosts today, and we will be together during the whole session. And I would like to continue with our webinar series. We did the mastering the NPN fellowship application and then fellowship interview webinars. And now we are doing the third one at, as fellows panel. We are gonna have five panelists. They will answer all our questions that we pulled from our survey. And I, I'm sure we are gonna have a lot of fun with them. And as our webinar outline, we are gonna start with our panelist introductions and then we are gonna continue with the review of full questions. And if we have time at the end, we are gonna review of questions from chat box and we will be finishing with announcement of upcoming events and then it will be our end of our session. Awesome. So um, I'll do the um, kind of first two introductions um, and I'll say uh, your names panelists and then um, you're welcome to kind of um, introduce however you please. Um, and if you could also tell us um, the, one of the most surprising things about fellowship as part of your introduction. So we'll start off with Michelle Bartlett. Hi, everyone. So excited to be here tonight. And I will correct you and say co-creator. I was not the only creator of Future Nears Now. Um, I'm a first-year fellow at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I did my residency um, out in Seattle. My interests, my scholarly interests are in medical education, particularly surrounding um, prenatal counseling skills. And then I was thinking a lot about this question about what the most surprising thing about transitioning to fellowship was. And I think something that um, really surprised me was how quickly I, I felt like I transitioned into the role of fellow compared to resident. I thought I would still feel like a resident, um, but I feel like within the first week I was like, oh no, I'm actually the fellow. Like I'm doing fellow things now, not resident things. And I think that was surprising to me, but also very exciting. That's awesome. Yes, co-creator, friend, <laughs> all the things. Um, our next panelist is, um, oops, sorry, is Josh Daniel. Hey guys, I'm Josh. Um, currently a first year fellow at Yale. Um, my research interests include um, neonatal intubation safety, QI, and MEDID as well. Um, I would say the most surprising aspect, I think it's a little bit similar to Michelle's, but I think it's the fact that when you transition to a fellow, it's different from a resident in that like um, the level of skills are just not really the same. And you also get this new sense of autonomy that is a little bit different in residency that I think I had, I was kind of put in early on. And I guess I was surprised that you can adjust to it quicker than you expect um, with the proper guidance and orientation. Um, I think that was probably one of the more surprising things. Thank you so much for Michelle and uh, Jen, they're here. And our third panelist is Jane Huang, we have here. Hey guys, my name's Jane. I'm calling in from Oregon. Um, I'm a current uh, first year fellow at OHSU. Um, kind of had a different path to NICU fellowship. Um, worked for a few years as a NICU hospitalist and then did a hospice palliative fellowship and then um, worked as a hospice palliative doctor and now I'm here. So um, I, I, I feel like one of the most surprising things about transitioning to fellowship, um, specifically in neonatology was um, just kind of how much you work as a team. Um, you know, you work alongside a lot of different providers in different roles and, you know, it's um, it was um, another good reminder that, you know, sometimes um, you're working with interns who've never done NICU before and then you're working with seasoned residents and then APs who've been doing this more, 
years than you've been alive. And so um, just kind of managing and working alongside a lot of different personalities and um, people with wide ranges of experiences have been um, kind of one of the more uh, unique things that I have encountered going um, into fellowship. Amazing. And our next panelist, we have Dawani Oza. Hey guys, I'm Dawani. Um, I'm originally from Ohio, but I'm currently doing my fellowship at um, UT Austin at Dell Medical. And I agree for everyone who has gone before me, but one of the most surprising things was is how easy it was to transition into like that leadership role and from for people to see us as like fellows versus what residency is. So that's been a nice change. And then last but not least, we have Claire Batty. Hey everyone, my name is Claire. I'm a first year fellow here at the University of Louisville and I did residency here as well. Um, I'm interested in med ed, um, have some interest in palliative care and ethics as well. And thinking about um, one of the most surprising things about starting fellowship, um, some other people also highlighted this, but really actually being embraced as a leader of the team, being welcomed by the all the aspects of the multidisciplinary team and being kind of that go-to person for nursing staff and pharmacy and just really enjoyed being a part of that so far. Um, awesome. And um, to start off our um, questions, we were just going to go in the same order um, as our introductions to kind of keep things streamlined and so that our panelists know when they're going next. Um, but yeah, Malak, take it away. Yep, we can start with question one. And how does the transition occur? What was the hardest part? And what was the most unexpected or surprising aspect you encountered during the transition that you hadn't prepared for? We can start with Michelle and go with Josh and Jane maybe, and then continue with Dawani and Claire. I think for the transition for me, um, honestly, the hardest part was transitioning from like a different hospital system. Like you graduate residency as a third year and you're like, I know all the little quirks and things of my like, you know, personal hospital system. And then you move to a new hospital system and you're like, Ooh, I don't know how to order this. I don't know what you do here. And I don't know the protocol for this. Um, so I think that still is taking some getting used to is just the the little like nitty gritty details that you take advantage of that you realize, you know, by the end of residency that you might not know in a new place. Um, I think, yeah, that would I'll I'll keep it short and sweet and pass it on to Josh. Um, yeah, so how does the transition go um, for us? It was we had like orientation for about a month and then there were some shadowing shifts kind of intermixed within that. So I'm sure it's probably standard at a lot of programs. So the shadowing shifts is kind of, I just asked a lot of questions and that kind of helped me before I did my calls on my own as soon as I finished orientation. So overall, I feel like that transition was well based on the infrastructure of how like some programs do it. Um, The hardest part I would say, it's kind of similar actually to what Michelle said. I think when you're in your NICU residency, you're very comfortable and confident with a lot of the guidelines. Um, But then when I went to a new hospital, um, everything was kind of different and that's kind of normal and Nikki you'll see there's a lot of different styles and then you're going to just have to get used to the different styles of a unit um so I think that was something so, so I think for me learning all the different styles that were different from my home institution um was probably like the harder part but I think we had all those guidelines and pathways on um on like an online link so I kind of reviewed that during orientation so that I could familiarize myself better Um, yeah, I agree with um, what Michelle and Josh both said. Um, I think certainly learning kind of the details of the hospital, you know, the different kinds of rounds that take place where you're expected to be a part of. Um, I felt like um, something that was a little bit um, unexpected was, was how much initiative you have to take on your own. Um, you know, I felt like... Um, with the formal curriculum series, you know, it's just for the way that we do it. We have one hour lectures um, on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And I do feel like um, there still is a lot of burden on the individual to continue um, learning outside of the formal curriculum. 
Um, and then I think the um, other unexpected thing is um, the amount of initiative it takes to kind of seek out what your scholarly project will be and kind of figuring that out um, and um, not feeling um, hesitant to reach out to different uh, physicians who um, have kind of expertise in whatever area of research you're trying to do, whether it be QI or uh, formal research. Yeah, I agree with what everyone said before me. Um, we also had a one month like boot camp where it was just lectures and different like sims to get us into the NICU world and like know what the protocols of our hospitals were. So that was really nice and made it a little easier when we got onto the floors and doing it all of our calls by ourselves. And one of the unexpected, unexpected things for me again was the same as like, you do have to take a lot of initiative on ourselves. Um, for research blocks, there's no like set guidelines on what you need to be done in this month or the next month. So it's like what you have to start planning ahead and see where you're, what you want to do for your interest for a scholarly project, your QI and things like that. Yeah, I can definitely agree with everything that um, our team has described. And I also had an orientation month uh, for our first year fellows, which was super, super helpful with a bunch of different SIMs, um, learning about ECMO, um, getting a bunch of different training from pharmacy, nutrition, um, and things like that. And we also had some um, shared um, call shifts that we got to shadow with one of our senior fellows. Um, and one of the surprising things um, as well, I mean, I thought for me, it was interesting just to um, have some more autonomy for leading the team and being that person to lead it. And sometimes the, attending even in that first month on service would say, okay, it's up to you to kind of lead the team and take over the teaching. So it was cool to be thrown into that like pretty early on and actually to embrace that role. Awesome. Thank you all for, for all of your thoughts and comments on this first question. Um, in order to give some time to for um, folks who have um, questions at the end, we'll kind of split up the rest of the questions um, so that, um, uh, you know, we'll have two to three people answer each one so that we have uh, time left over. So we'll have Dwani and Claire answer this second question. Um, how does fellowship compare to residency in terms of patient load and shift hours? Um, are the expectations for fellows notably high or higher in terms of clinical responsibilities? Yeah, I feel like the clinical load is probably a little higher compared to residency, at least from where I came from, because as residents, we were capped at a certain number. Um, in fellowship, you're seeing all of the patients that are on your attendings, like Neo's list, which could be anywhere between like 15 to 20, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. Um, and you do get to oversee all of those patients. There are mid levels or APPs that will have half of like our here the system is where we have two nurse practitioners who have half the um, patient base and then we see all of them for both of them so I feel like it's a little more but it's manageable it's nothing too crazy and when it comes to shift hours our typical day is anywhere between like 10 to 12 hours when we're on service but we're not going anywhere near what ACG me um, 80 hours are so it doesn't seem like it's a lot uh, expectations for fellows I do feel like as a fellow when you go into that leadership role you do have a little bit more of a clinical responsibility because now you're seeing these patients as your own and you're taking all the responsibility for them which is also nice because then you're taking that added step to take care of those patients and those families so which is nice to have that kind of feeling too. Yeah, I agree. The patient load and shift hours, in terms of patient load and clinical load, I do think it was um, a little bit more, um, a little bit more challenging in terms of when I had in residency, um, more expectations for being the um, first call for um, from nursing staff um, and leading the team. Also being head of bed and being in charge of that, which is also a really cool experience to start having more autonomy um, in fellowship for that. And um, for us as fellows, we also carry the transport phone. And so that's something that um, we didn't, I didn't have experience doing in residency, but we are triaging a lot of the transports that are coming in and being that go-to person um, for high-risk um, deliveries and transports as well. Our shift hours are pretty similar um, as well. We are on, um, when we're on service, it's Monday through Friday. And for the most part, we'll have weekends off. And then we have some sprinkled 
call nights or 24 hour shifts, just like a few times a month as well. But I don't feel like it's as frequent as what I had when I was in residency. Yep. Uh, thank you for those answers. Now we are gonna continue with the question three and I'm gonna toward my question to Michelle, Josh and Jane. Our question is, what steps can we take to ready ourselves for fellowship? Can you share some valuable resources for reading in advance of the fellowship? And looking back, are there any preparations you wish you had made? Um, <clears throat> similar to what everyone else had said, I think like what prepared me the most for fellowship was like the first month, which we had like a boot camp orientation shadow calls. Um, I did a couple extra blocks of NICU during my residency, which I found helpful because I felt like it made me very comfortable with NRP and some of the more like basic procedures of um, NICU, which, you know, I found helpful, but not everybody necessarily has that opportunity. And I definitely don't think it's necessary. Um, I took a lot of like little notes during residency on like little teaching topics we got when we were in NICU. And so I actually found that that was like my most helpful resource for reading up on like NEC or ROP or all those like little things that you forget. Um, so kind of just like brushing up on the like basics of it, but you're going to learn so much when you get to fellowship that honestly, just like enjoy the little break you might get between residency and fellowship as you know, a little bit, but you're going to, you're definitely going to learn um, very quickly uh, once you start fellowship. And I don't think that there's anything in particular that I wish I had like prepared differently for fellowship, at least for me. Yeah. Um, I think similarly for me as well, um, steps to prepare, I would say, yeah, knowing, I guess, the common things and the common diagnoses and the basic management will kind of be important, I think. Um, there are some like resources and books. Um, I wouldn't go necessarily into like studying anything, but things you could always use to reference. Gomella has like a pocket neonatology book. If you feel like you need to brush up on like vent stuff, then there's a book, Assisted Ventilation of the Neonate, that's pretty good. There's something called the Incubator that has podcasts if you're more of an auditory learner um there's like neo board review books but like if you just wanted a quick refresher on stuff they're like the term is like the brodsky books we use there's like a lot of youtube channels so i wouldn't go into crazy into setting i think if you haven't taken your boards i would focus on that and enjoying the rest of your third year um but if there's something you feel like you're a little bit weaker on then you could always just look up or brush up on something beforehand if you want Um, yeah, I mean, I echo, um, kind of the resources that Josh mentioned. Um, I think, uh, you know, familiarizing yourself with NRP is pretty vital before starting fellowship. Um, but I do agree that there are, um, different simulations and, uh, resources available as you start fellowship that will try to reinforce those things. Um, I, I do think that, um, you know, once you start clinical time, um, you know, the expectation is, is that you do know how to do specific things and know specific topics. So I do agree that like the really common diagnoses that you see in neonatology, like would be a, probably a good idea to, you know, brush up on, you know, PDAs and PPH and things like that. Um, I think for me, one of the things that, um, I kind of wish I had, um, done a little bit, uh, before starting was, just maybe watching some YouTube videos on like POCUS and doing some, some kind of like ultrasonography. And um, I think that um, is something that, you know, is integrated into our curriculum, which is helpful, but um, just as um, somebody who hadn't done that many um, ultrasounds kind of uh, leading up to NICU, like it um, was just a, something that I wish I would have done a little bit more of. Awesome. Um, for question four, um, directed to Thwani and Claire, um, could you discuss the experience of studying for boards while beginning fellowship? Yeah, honestly, I was so scared before starting fellowship because I was not going to have enough time to study for boards and things like that. But honestly, I had a really good chunk allowed for me to study 
one, you have the boot camp, so you still have time in the afternoon to be able to study. But then we were fortunate that we had at least one block before boards that was given as like a reading block for boards. So that was like a good four weeks where we were able to study. And um, for like resources, I use med studies. Some people use like the pediatric board review, but it's a nice time to be able to at least do questions when you're um, still in the hospital and things like that. And at home, you can do your actual studying. I agree. I was very nervous about how it's going to be able to balance starting fellowship and balance studying for boards um, that was coming up in October. But I do feel like I was given sufficient time. Um, I had one full service month that I was on in August. And during that time, I found it was a little bit harder to really dedicate some time to doing questions. But I would try to do some like flashcards here and there, especially like at night or if it was like a really af an afternoon that there wasn't a lot going on. And then when I did have my dedicated time, it was about six weeks um, before boards to um, perfectly dedicated for boards. Um, that was really helpful to just be able to do that. I still had some call shifts that was sprinkled throughout there as well. Um, but our program directors and attendings were really supportive and letting us know, hey, we want you guys to really focus on getting through this. And then we'll make sure that you can really focus on your role as a fellow and then get into more of the training as a fellow for NICU. It's really nice to hear that it was not that hard for you guys. And now we are going to continue with question five. I'm going to direct my question to, again, Michelle, Josh, and Jane. How much time do you typically dedicate to research? What are the expectations for initiating a research project during a predominantly clinically focused first year? And what is the ideal time for initiating a research project? I'm very lucky at my program that we have a whole block. It's actually coordinated around when we take boards and it's can, it's our like research orientation block. So it's like a second orientation, four weeks. And they we have it scheduled right around boards. So it also gives us a lot of flexibility to study for boards, but it's also a time for us to kind of start thinking about our research project. And it's mostly geared towards kind of introducing us to faculty and some of their research interests. Um, as well as giving you time to start to set up meetings and meet with potential research mentors, which I found was very helpful to kind of have that time to start to think about it, um, as well as study for the boards. Uh, we do six, six to seven months of clinical time our first year. And so I have found that I actually feel like I do have a fair amount of time between my service blocks to start working on my research or other scholarly activities. Um, and then we have pretty significant chunks, both our second and third years. You can kind of adjust your schedule a little bit, depending on what your research interests are and, you know, kind of what time timelines you are needing to meet. Um, but I think really, you know, the expectations are you kind of start to identify a research mentor and start to think about a project during your first year. You, you know, by no means have to have any, um, you know, you don't have to have your project completed or near completion um, at all during your first year. Um, yeah, so I think um, where I am, it's, there's there isn't a dedicated like research block. So it's kind of during the weeks where I'm not on service or not on call, it's kind of expected that you could do your research during that time. So I think um, it's nice because it's like, I'll do my research kind of when I kind of want to and during my downtime like that. Um, expectations, how it worked for us is in the beginning, we had some formal structured lectures on just what to start thinking about, who to start connecting with, um, um, research questions that potentially you should be potentially asking. And then I would say before boards, the only expectation was really just having meetings with different faculty, just getting to know like what the research is. So it was kind of very um, relaxed, I would say in that aspect. After boards, I think it was the time where I tried to like actually decide who my mentor was. Um, and then by January, we kind of should know our mentor and hopefully like know what project you're gonna do. And then from the months after that, it's kind of just on the weeks where I'm not on service and I have time, I'll start kind of reason to try and look into my research and then at the end of the year like we usually have like a little research check-in meeting so that kind of is like a good motivation to make sure that you met some kind of task but I would say like no one's expected you to complete any kind of project or anything um but I would just say just to start thinking of at least what you want to be studying yeah I agree with um what was 
uh, previously said, I, I think that um, in terms of like identifying who your research mentor is going to be is probably like the first thing that you um, should be thinking about in the first, you know, several months of fellowship. And then um, kind of with that, considering what project you're going to do, I think by like this, you know, second half of your first year seems uh, reasonable. Um, at OHSU, we have like a dedicated uh, humans investigation program that is a two year weekly um, curriculum that we um, all have to take that's mandatory. And um, it's basically um, structured in a way where you develop a proposal and um, ideally that proposal gets submitted for a grant submission. Um, and so um, just for context, you know, we can either start that our first year or our second year, just depending on kind of whatever the fellow wants. And at this point in time, in April of our first year, um, you know, we are, you know, finished developing our proposal. So that's kind of the timeline that has been set. Um, but, you know, by no means um, do I think that that's needed, but um, just to kind of give a better uh, sense of, you know, what we do at OHSU. Awesome. Uh, so for question six, which I think as us residents, we probably see like, I don't know, 5% of, <laughs> of what fellows are probably doing all day. So um, for Claire and uh, Dwani, um, could you describe a typical day as a fellow? And for any of the other panelists, if you want to chime in as well, um, we're all very curious. <laughs> yeah, um, so a typical day on, on service, I'm currently on service, is we will round, we'll start doing sign out around 8 a.m. So I am typically like to get there around 7 just to get started getting my numbers, looking at x-rays and things like that. Um, but then they'll do sign out at 8 and by like 9.30ish is when we'll start rounding for the teams. And usually the goal is you'll be done rounding by noon to <laughs> before lunch. That depends on the attending. Um, but after rounds, there are different huddles, whether that's like discharge rounds, milk rounds. So you'll be expected to be the leader and go to those and have those discussions with like um, our nutrition nutritionists and things like that. And then in the afternoon, it's mainly just doing little education chalk talks for the residents who are on service, talking about different pathophysiology that's currently in the unit going with our respiratory therapist to learn about a vent or what changes we can make to a baby and things like that. And then we'll have sign out for night around 5 p.m. Um, of course, if there's deliveries in the meantime, we'd go to those deliveries. Our hospital, we do 124 every week when we're on service. So it's at the end of the week, usually a Friday or a Saturday. So we'll have a 24 hour call and then we'll be post call afterwards. Yeah, sounds like my our days on service are also pretty similar. Um, we get our sign out from the night team starting at 7.30 in the morning. Um, I'll also get there a little bit early, maybe around 7.15, 7, just to get my list printed and start looking at numbers and uh, get a little organized um, before the day starts. And we actually do our huddles um, in the morning right before we round. So we meet with our charge nurses and the rest of the providers all as a group to talk about the like any big plans for the day, transports that might be coming in, high risk deliveries and how everyone's doing with their numbers. So it's a good check in to make sure all the teams are getting well supported. And then we start our rounds, um, depending on if I'm with the learning team, if I have learners on my team with residents and med students, we'll start rounding once they're ready and they take charge in being the ones to present and do the notes, uh, which is a nice aspect as a fellow, not always have to do all the notes. And we usually will round you until about noon because that's when the residents have their um, conference that they go to. In the afternoon, we'll um, entail like just other time for teaching, uh, catching up on things, updating families. Uh, we'll go to deliveries throughout the day as well. If I'm not on the teaching team, I'll have my own list of patients that I see independently. Um, which is nice to have that autonomy and just be able to figure out my own time management and to see my own patients. And then I'll staff them with the attending um, a little bit later in the afternoon. And then we sign out at 3.30 in the afternoon for the night team. So our night shifts are a little bit, a little bit long sometimes, but that's our typical day. Thank you so much for those. And now I have 
question seven. And again, this question goes, um, Shell, Josh, and Jane. And what guidance would you offer to a prospective fellow lacking a robust procedural background? Do most fellows begin their fellowship already skilled in performing NICU procedures? I feel like procedures are always a hot topic. Um, I definitely don't think you need to go into fellowship having um, a procedural background at all. Um, I feel like fellowship is going to definitely give you a lot of exposure to a lot of the procedures. I think um, kind of how I mentioned earlier, like being comfortable with NRP is very important. And then, you know, if you have the opportunity to um, kind of like scrub in and like learn how to do umbilical lines beforehand, like that's helpful, but it's definitely not necessary. Um, I would not say most fellows begin their fellowship already skilled in performing NICU procedures. And like, I definitely was not skilled in performing NICU procedures, but like, you know, it's April of my first year and I feel very confident in like most procedures, including intubations, umbilical lines, chest tubes, um, you know, a lot of the common procedures um, that we're expected you know, to do. And, you know, there is some, um, you know, oftentimes that depending on your program or your um, hospital, um, like how you divvy up procedures with other, you know, providers or practitioners. And um, I think every program is a little bit different. Our program, our first five intubations are supposed to go to the um, first year fellows. And then after that, it's kind of a conversation. Um I found that most of the time people are very willing um, to like give you the procedure or, you know, um, are very, you know, okay with you doing the procedure, especially if you're kind of like, hey, like, you know, I don't have experience doing this or I feel, I don't feel very comfortable doing this. Um, and so just like being able to have open communication and talking about it. Um, and then there's also just an important, um, Heather was on earlier, but, you know, she has taught me the importance of like, being able to supervise procedures. So like being able to teach others procedures is very important. So like teaching the residents how to do umbilical lines or, you know, talking through an intubation with a resident um, is a very important skill that um, I think we kind of forget that is also a job that we are gonna have to be able to do in the future. And I agree, agree with what Michelle said. Um, I would say it's perfectly fine if you don't have really much procedures in a background. If you did have something like that can only help but if you didn't, I think you would still be, you wouldn't be at a disadvantage because when you start fellowship, you should be prioritized for your procedures anyways. So this first few months, you're really getting comfortable. And I think it might be even an advantage if you're not too much of an expert in one kind of field, because I feel like when you go to a different institution, they may have different kits and equipment or different kind of styles of a procedure. So you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be breaking any kind of like habits you had from your prior experience. So it might be an advantage as well um, to do that. Um, and yeah, I would say the only advice maybe I would say is it's it would be helpful to know like the basics of a procedure. You don't necessarily need to know every single step in your head, but basics meaning like intubations, I would just be familiar with what airway anatomy or umbilical lines, be familiar just with where the catheter tip should be on x-ray. So I would say like very basic things would be helpful to know coming in, but I think the best learning will be scrubbing in and then doing it yourself. Yeah, I um, completely agree. Um, I, I felt very rusty coming in um, and doing procedures. And so I was very nervous about that, but um, definitely agree that, um, you know, you are prioritized um, here um, at our institution. Um, they were, it seems like we're very lucky because for like the first six months, we basically um, tend to get most of the procedures, uh, but specifically intubations and chest tubes kind of um, the more sought after procedures. Um, and, um, uh, and I think that really like the more you do it and, um, you know, whether you're failing or succeeding, I think you, um, will learn with every procedure, what went well and what could have been improved upon. And, um, I think really the only way to truly learn is to just kind of put yourself out there and do that and do them. Um, yeah. And I do agree that like the basic things of like, you know, the different formulas for uh, where umbilical lines should 
um, be calculated to or, you know, on an x-ray or kind of just the anatomy, you know, what to do if you're in trouble uh, with an intubation, um, you know, basic things I do think might be helpful to review. Um, a book that um, the APs had in their office that I found was really helpful for more kind of like um, procedures like super pubic taps that um, we don't do very frequently. It's called McDonald's Atlas of Procedures book, um, which I found to be very helpful for like um, art sticks and things like that. Um, and so, um, so yeah. Um, and this is our last um, kind of, uh, this is our last predetermined question. Um, we just had one um, come in through the chat so far. So um, feel free to send any more um, since we have a little bit of time remaining. But um, I think we'd love if all of our panelists could answer this question since it's um, so kind of individual. But what difficulties do you encounter in balancing life outside of fellowship? And are there notable differences compared to life during residency. Um, we'll start with Dwani and Claire, and then we'll kind of go down the list of our trio. After I honestly feel like balancing home and like work has been a little easier coming into fellowship versus residencies because I feel like a lot of times our schedules are a little more flexible. Um, we were fortunate enough to actually pick our own calls so that might not be for every institution. So if we knew ahead of time that we had like a wedding or something, we could have just picked a different call when we made the schedules together in the beginning of the year with all the rest of the fellows. But at the same time, we do have like those research blocks where we are in charge of our own schedules and come doing our research. So we don't have to be in the hospital 24 seven or even every day. Um, my husband works three and a half hours from where I am currently. So I've been lucky that I could go where he is and do my research from there. So it's been nice to have that kind of flexibility. Yeah, I definitely agree. I feel like my quality of life as a fellow has been way, way better than when I was a resident. I do think that there's some more free time, flexibility, um, like I said earlier, a lot of the time as fellows, um, especially for on service, we're not necessarily on on the weekends. There'll be like one fellow that's designated as a call shift for each weekend day. So I've had more free weekends than I ever had as a resident. And even with call shifts, I feel like they're not um, overbearing. It's not like a Q2 or Q3. It's actually like pretty well spaced out, at least um, for our group. Um, in terms of other notable differences, I don't have to worry about being like the backup call person at home all the time, or at least if I am going to have to be called in to help out, I know I'm coming to the NICU. I'm coming to the place that I want to work at and want to be at. So I don't have to go back to the ER ever again or something like that. So that has been a nice change. And I just really like that um, our group's been super supportive in helping each other. And so it's been, yeah, it's just been wonderful. I would totally agree. I think it's definitely better than residency. It's still very busy, um, but I find that I definitely have more free time and time to myself. I ran my first marathon in the fall and I like trained for that while also while being a first year fellow and studying for boards. And so somehow I found time to do that. In retrospect, I actually don't know how I did it. Um, but I, it's definitely easier and it's definitely a lot more doable than residency. Our schedule is, um, our chief fellows set our schedule, but we are a little bit of a larger fellowship group. And so there is a lot of flexibility with our schedules as well, um, especially around our call shifts. And similarly, if we know we have big events or weddings or other things, um, we can, you know, let them know that in advance or people are always willing to trade, which is really, really nice. And similarly, our call schedule um, does not feel like, you know, too heavy of a burden. It, on average, it feels like it's about once a week, maybe once to twice a week, depending, um, which feels like a lot less than residency to me. And it only gets less as we go on in fellowship. And so um, it definitely feels a lot more doable than residency, which is nice. Yeah, so I think similarly as well. Um, I definitely have more weekends off in fellowship, which is nice. Um, I would say I think the schedule is better for me as a fellow because as a resident, if I have if I was on call overnight, I would be on an elective in the day, then I would go to my call overnight. 
But here, it's like when I have a call at night, I'm always off in the day before that. So like, I don't have, I don't really have any clinical responsibilities until my call starts at like 4.30 p.m. So during that time is when I could just do like research or light things, but I wasn't expected to be on any elective rotation or anything. So I think that's nice. I think just service weeks might be like the most busiest for me. So that's where I might be, it might be harder to schedule things, but also like we're very flexible at the program. So we just kind of swap ships within each other all the time. It doesn't really have to go through any big approval process or anything. So I think it's common if you have any life events or anything, I haven't had any issues with just swapping with somebody. Uh, yeah, I agree. I feel like um, the schedule is pretty uh, doable. I, I do feel like when, when you're on nights or when you're on days here at uh, our program, we uh, actually don't work any 24 hour shifts. We um, have just weeks of days or weeks of nights that we're on. Um, and then you're just on backup occasionally. Um, and so um, uh, here it's, you know, very doable. I, I do think when I'm on nights, you know, I'm a little tired, like I'm post call today and, um, you know, it's, it's, there are painful points, um, to every fellowship, I think. Um, but I do feel like it's really nice because most fellowship programs seem to be very heavy in the clinic in the first year. And then your second and third year, um, seem to lighten up. And so, um, I have not had any issues balancing home life, but I also don't have children. Um, our fellowship is a little bit smaller. We have two fellows a year. And so, um, you know, this upcoming, uh, summer we'll have two fellows out on FMLA, um, at the same time, which is causing a little bit of kind of painful points for, um, the people who will still be, uh, present. But, um, aside from that, you know, I, I think, life stuff happens. So it's, it's totally fine. Um, speaking a little bit um, about what um, Jane um, had mentioned in terms of um, any folks who have children, we had one question come in um, asking if any of the panelists uh, have kids during fellowship or, um, or know of um, co-fellows who have had uh, children during fellowship um, and how, how that process um, has been so far. I personally don't have any kids, but I can just speak of the fellows, at least in the program that do. Um, we have fellows that do have like multiple kids or fellows that are pregnant. So like, I think work-life balance for them. I mean, I can't speak personally for them, but I think like it makes it work. Like if there's ever an issue, like where one fellow needs to leave early to pick up their kid, for example, I don't think anyone has an issue um, stepping in or helping. So I think like we kind of just help each other out and especially when we're a second or third year in our program, the clinical service is much lighter. So I think it's a lot easier to feel like family responsibilities um, if that's a big priority. So I think like whatever stage it is, I'm pretty sure the fellowship, wherever you go, will work with you. Um, and then our last question that came in through the chat was um, if we can go down the line. So Michelle, Josh, Jane, Duani, Claire, um, your either your favorite um, thing um, about fellowship so far, or the most unique um, kind of aspect of your program. Um, I think my favorite thing. I do feel like I'm given a lot of autonomy, and I really enjoy that. It, I, I don't know. It makes me feel feel like be like a real doctor, like I'm making real decisions. Um. Some things that are unique about CHOP, um, I think there's a couple of different things that I really like about it that I think are maybe unique to it, um, maybe not. Um, we, When we are on call overnight or on the weekends, we take on the role and um, we don't like round on a specific team. Um, it, we have a hundred bed uh, unit and so we kind of get sign out on like the sick babies of every team but we definitely don't get sign out on all 100 babies um but we're also med command and like transport and so we kind of have to deal a lot with like bed management and accepting patients from other institutions or other places and kind of deciding where they go and who's urgently needs to come and who doesn't urgently need to come um and then similarly we at times go out on transports for the really sick babies too um which i think has been a really interesting um 
experience, but also just like learning how to manage babies from afar is a, a very um, unique skill that I think, um, you know, is not necessarily um, unique to like, you know, learning how to uh, be med commander and take care of babies from afar is not unique to CHOP, but it is very interesting. Um, and then similarly, I just think the acuity of CHOP, it uh, can be very high, which can feel very scary at times, but um, is very um, clinically rewarding. I feel like I have learned so, so, so much um, just because there's so many interesting pathologies and there's so many sick babies. And so you're always learning and thinking. And um, I think that has been really great. Yeah, so I would say I think one of the highlights I think of fellowship is I enjoyed when I was resident in the NICU and hence why I went to fellowship. But I would say, but that's also all I knew. I think once I had the fellow role, I realized, wow, it's like a lot better even. Um, so it's like a lot of, let's say, tasks that aren't like high yield for learning. I don't, I'm not expected to do that as a fellow. So I think just leading rounds, teaching um, as a resident, I would like check certain plans with, um, you know, a fellow or attending. But now it's like a very experienced APPs are now coming to you. And you're kind of just, I think it's a good learning curve when you're helping advise or kind of checking plans and things like that. So I think it's a, it was a new role that I liked. And then as a fellow, then getting that priority for procedures is something that I'm interested in. So I like that. Um, and I think just like where I am, I think the extent of like this, the structured simulations, I really like that. And we have, we follow like the flipped classroom curriculum. So I'm always like learning from that as well. Um, and then really just the extensive kind of unique cases, what we'll get is something that's kind of exciting that I enjoy. Um, yeah, I actually, I really love OHSU and I'm very, um, very happy at my program. I think the thing that surprised me the most was how much I love all of my attendings. Um, every single one of them have been, um, incredible in their own way. Um, and, you know, we're all on a first name basis. Um, I've really enjoyed also sitting in the same room as the attendings because I feel like, you know, even attendings will have questions about different difficult cases and they'll talk about it amongst each other and you're privy to all of those conversations. Um, and so I've, I've found that there's a lot of learning that kind of happens um, sitting in the same room with them. Um, and I do uh, agree that you know, being in the kind of leadership role and um, being able to do tasks that almost like mimic what an attending needs to do, like managing kind of, um, you know, the census. Um, we also take transfer calls as well. So kind of figuring out like what needs um, a level for NICU right now versus could be diverted. Um, we actually don't go on transports, um, which um, as I've never gone on a transport, so I don't really know what I'm uh, missing out on. Um, but I, but I do feel like it lets you focus on the unit. But I do think that there would be a lot of positive experience going out on transport as well. Um, one of the cool things about OHSU is we actually have a telemedicine um, that's set up across various community hospitals um, in Oregon, and so we'll have people call us, and um, you know, if a baby's born and they're doing CPR and need help intubating we can zoom in and it's very high fidelity and you have to learn how to um, be basically leading a code um, through a video. Um, and so that's something that's definitely been kind of a learning curve, but um, is very, um, you know, a nice skill to have. Um, I also really like at OHSU that we're centralized at one hospital and not kind of split up across different campuses. And um, I, because we have the same attendings there, you know, the practices are kind of uniform. We share clinical guidelines. And so um, there's not like too much variability in what you're learning. Um, and, um, and because, you know, we're a smaller hospital, we have about, um, you know, 50-ish beds. Um, we, we're mostly should be staffed for like the high 40s, but um, you end up getting to know every single baby. And um, on nights, we're alone. And we end up calling the um, attending if we have any questions, which definitely, I think, kind of promotes autonomy and clinical decision making. And some of the things I loved about fellowship, one of them is transport. Um, we've gotten 
the chance to we do flix, fixed wing as well. So we'll pick up babies that are six, seven hours away if they're really sick and need to come for ECMO. So that's been a great opportunity because once you're there, you're you're the one managing the patient, especially if they're sick on the way back, if anything goes wrong and you have attending on the phone. Um, another thing unique to our program, I guess not unique, but one of the things that our program really focuses on is POCUS. So it's been nice that um, during the first year, it's been a, a thing that all the first fellow, first year fellows will get trained in doing at least I, lines and things out of POCUS. And then we are going to be the people who will teach the rest of the unit as it goes out. So that's been nice to have that roll out slowly too. Um, but yeah, I think fellowship has been way more fun than I would have expected as a resident. Um, I was going to say two things that have been like some of my highlights that I've enjoyed so far in fellowship is one, especially is procedures and just having the opportunity, to do so many different things and trying out chest tubes, umbilical lines, intubations. And then I never thought when I first started out, like it was, I was thinking, oh, it'll probably be second year once I'm comfortable teaching these. But really it was after just like a month or two, like getting the chance to do several and just practicing and practicing even having the chance to practice on Sims or on like intubating a, um, a dummy, just trying that over and over. And then once I got to get comfortable with that, having the chance to teach it and then seeing a resident get that intubation or get that umbilical line, it's such a cool feeling. And to see that that's something that you could share and to be a part of the team doing that. So that's been a really, really phenomenal part that I've enjoyed. And then another thing um, that we haven't talked too much about, but I think most fellowships include as well is um, NICU follow-up clinic. Um, on our non-service months, occasionally we get the chance to do NICU follow-up clinic. And that's been super, super cool to see a lot of these babies who are now a lot older and following them in their development, nutrition, and seeing that they're doing overall like well out there. And we get the chance to travel to some of our outreach clinics and go to some more rural areas too, that some of our babies are um, from and to see where those families are. So that's been a really cool thing to keep that continuity. Some babies I took care of in the NICU and now I get to see them in clinic too. Thank you for all those answers. I would like to take this opportunity to thank to all our panelists and participants. It was really nice to have you guys hearing your experiences and more than that, seeing you are smiling, you are motivated and happy. Now we are all so excited and we are looking forward to start our own, own journey. And before ending our presentation, I would like to announce our next webinar. It's going to be about sci scientists and we're going to call it the physician scientist panel and you are going to get our email and advertisement when we have the clear date and time. And I hope to see you all there also. And Mikala, if you want to add anything. No, that was perfect. Thanks for joining everybody. And thank you to all of our panelists for um, spending the time with us today. Um, it was really wonderful to hear all the things you had to say. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.